All right, today we're going to look at Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35. It says in verse 1 here, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm, feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame leap like a deer for the tongue of the mute and the tongue of the mute shall sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. And a highway shall be there. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I remember as a little boy, maybe uh, not old enough to know the difference between 50 years and 50 million years, really, but catching wind uh, somehow, somewhere on a, maybe a TV program, maybe it was in a book or something somebody was reading to me, that at one point in the future, the sun is going to grow and expand as it becomes what's called a red giant. And it's eventually going to swallow up the whole planet, Earth. And we're all literally supposed to become toast. Now, not knowing the difference between the 50 years and 5 billion years, I got a little nervous about that. And I remember going to Mom saying, what about this, Mom? What about this, Mom? But we've all heard the scenarios we've all seen. If you watch Star Wars, the possibility of some uh, a future galaxy coming into ours uh, from the dark side of the force and, and having the Death Star that can destroy the entire planet. Or maybe a comet that can come and destroy the entire planet and hit the planet. Or maybe it's like a, a new ice age that engulfs the entire planet and everything just freezes solid from the North Pole to the South Pole. Or the magnetic field of the Earth comes undone and everything comes loose and nothing uh, uh, is staying together and all of life ceases on Earth. All of these uh, scenarios we've probably heard and we've seen the movies where we're trying to figure out how we're going to save the planet, how we're going to send a, a rocket ship to the asteroid to blow it up, or how we're going to escape the Earth uh, to go colonize Mars or some other planet in the future. So what is the future of the Earth? Well, the Bible tells us in different places, Psalm 104, Ecclesiastes 1, 4, Psalm 68, 9, uh, it tells us that the earth and its foundations have been laid to last forever and that it will not end. And then we hear in Psalm 102 and in Isaiah itself and uh, 2 Peter and Revelation, which is playing off of Isaiah, we hear that the earth is going to be destroyed and it will be dissolved. Even the very elements will melt with fervor and heat and fire. And it's going to be destroyed. So which is it? Is it going to last forever? Or is it going to be destroyed? Well, the answer to the question is yes. You know, we've got all kinds of things. We don't know how they work together. 
you know, it's kind of like the comedians have pointed out in the past, you know, it's kind of weird. I think it was Gallagher maybe who said it's kind of weird that we park in a driveway but drive on a parkway. You know, so we know how things can get a little uh, strange when it comes to language, but the answer is yes. The earth, the Bible tells us, will be reborn from the ashes of God's judgment. And the way to understand this is that the new will be reborn from the old. And the way to understand it is to parallel the human body from which it was taken from the earth, correct? With the earth itself. We know with our bodies that our bodies, after we re reach a certain age, is all downhill, right? It gets faster and faster as the years go by. And we begin to kind of fall apart, right? Things don't work like they used to. Uh, things... Uh, don't uh, stay together like they used to, and we have aches and pains, and the Bible actually says that we are wasting away. We all experience that. But the good news is, is even though our bodies are wasting away, it says our inner person, our inner spirit, those of us who have faith in Christ, is being renewed day by day. And we know as believers, our hope is not just our, that our souls will go off to be with God in heaven, but that when Christ comes again, our bodies will be resurrected. When they will be long incinerated or disintegrated or whatever you want to think of happening to your body after you're long gone, from those same elements, those things that made you who you are. And we know today that there's a code in us that's specific and unique to us. And from those remnants, God will raise up a new body that will be like Christ's glorious body. And the future is the same for the planet Earth. And just like the Bible says we should take care of our bodies, because they are the temple of the Lord, we should also apply that same logic to the earth. So even though our bodies are wasting away, even though our bodies are aging and deteriorating at a rate that we cannot slow down and we cannot help it to a certain extent. We can do things to kind of slow things down to a certain extent. There are some, some things that we have that are completely under our control, but there are a lot of host of other things that we have absolutely no control over whatsoever, right? You know, I can sort of control you know, the amount of Krispy Kreme donuts I eat. Uh, the best thing for me to do is not have them in the house, but the I can sort of control that, but there are other things, uh, genetic diseases and uh, inherited uh, ailments that I cannot control, accidents and things that can happen in this world that are beyond our control. So we have limitations in the way that we can take care of our body, right? We'll have the same for the earth. You know, like, like Greta Thunberg was the uh, young little uh, girl, 16-year-old girl that's going all over the world uh, talking about the dangers of climate change. She was just named Times, Time Magazine's Person of the Year. So this idea of saving the planet has been in the human psyche for a long time. It didn't just start yesterday, and it's very much in the news today. But the truth is, just like you and I can't save our own bodies when it comes right down to it, we can take care of them. But in order to save them, we're at a loss. We're hopeless only in and of ourselves. We can only do so much. Yeah, we got to take care of the planet, but I don't like the language of us saving the planet. I think it was the comedian George Carlin that said, you know, the earth will spit us out and, uh, you know, totally destroy us and keep on getting it for millions and millions of years long after we are gone, right? So there's certain limitations that we have, but the scriptures teach us that we should care for our bodies because they're the temple of the Lord and also care for the earth because God created the earth also to be his dwelling place, to be his temple. We have responsibility, but that responsibility comes with limitations. People wonder about how the earth got to be the way it is today and how we are here in the first place. And even in the ancient world, there were ideas and philosophies about how things just spontaneously generated. They just, things just for no rhyme or no reason, with no mind behind them, they just came into being spontaneously. 
And the idea among the Epicureans, for example, was that at some point in the future, things were just going to spontaneously combust and be uh, totally destroyed by fire. But then it was going to spontaneously just regenerate again. Well, that's not what the Scriptures teach us. That's not what the Bible teaches us. The hope of ourselves, the hope of our souls and our bodies, and the hope of the earth is not in some random, irrational event, but in an almighty and an all-powerful and an all-loving Creator God. So Christ came. When Christ came into this world, He gave us a glimpse and a foreshadow of not only our future, but the future of the whole earth. He fulfilled this prophecy in His healing ministry. It's interesting how the healing ministry of Jesus when He came into this world. This, this, this verse here in Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 35, where it talks about the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and the lame man leaping like a deer for joy. When Christ came into this world, He exercised His healing ministry. He healed people of all kinds of ailments and illnesses and all kinds of deficiencies and disabilities. Not just to do a few nice things for a few random people, but to foreshadow the future of people. To foreshadow the complete and the total healing that will come in the future. And that complete and total healing of humanity is directly tied here in Isaiah to the healing of the whole world, the whole earth. Isn't that cool? Now, one of the things that's really awesome for me to think about, you know, y'all look really good right now. I want to tell you, you look really, you dressed up for church. You're looking good. You got cleaned up. Some of you are saying, you need to quit lying, preacher. Don't tell yourself that. You're looking good. But I can't wait to see how good you look and how awesome you really are in the fullness of the kingdom of God. You know, we all have deficiencies. We all have disabilities. We're all differently abled and we're all going to suffer in some form or fashion in this life. And there's things... That, you know, some are going to be struggling mentally, others are going to be struggling emotionally, others are going to be struggling physically, and at some point if we live long enough, we'll all experience the, all of those things to a certain extent. But the promise of God that we got a down payment of in the, in the ministry of Jesus Christ on this earth was that that's not our future. Our future is Christ's past. And the future of the earth is as well. So our healing is connected with the healing of the whole world. In Romans 8, it talks about how the creation groans. It groans. And it's, it, it, the, the imagery that's used is like creation is itself kind of sticking its neck out, kind of looking around the corner to see, hey, when are these people going to finally be redeemed? When are these people going to finally be fully healed? I mean, it's like a, almost like a, a person with, I got a long neck, long neck looking around the corner, just waiting and longing to see our redemption, bodily redemption, when Christ comes again and when we're, we're raised from the dead because creation sees that its own redemption and its own liberation is tied to ours, and that's exactly what we see here. So we go from the groaning of creation at the coming of Christ. Creation itself here begins to sing for joy and gladness. It's not just us singing joy to the world. The world itself, the earth itself, is singing joy to the world. For the Lord has come. The Lord has come. So everything that Christ came to do, Everything that Christ came to do not only involves our souls, but also our bodies and the whole world. Where the world will break forth into singing. You see the, the healing here, right in the same verse when it talks about the, leap, the lame man leaping like a deer and the tongue of the mute singing for joy. And then it says, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, the burning sand shall become a pool in the thirsty ground. Springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. 
And he goes on to talk about that highway that will be there for the redeemed. That highway that will be there for the redeemed to walk on the road to Zion. Now where is Zion? Mount Zion? It's in a city. Billy knows. It's Jerusalem. We're going to be marching to Zion, singing for joy at all of creation, singing with us. So when we're tempted to despair, when we're tempted to, to, to be left wondering, is there really any hope for me? Is there anything beyond the misery and the pain that I'm experiencing in this moment, in this life? The answer is a resounding yes. When we're tempted to tremble and we're tempted to be afraid in the face of the forces of death and darkness, here Isaiah says, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come, first of all, with vengeance. With vengeance. Now, as I said last week, that's not something to be in fear of. That's not something to really, people get upset about this today, and if you're getting upset about this, the, the coming judgment of God, well, we need to think about it differently. It's something to look forward to when we're right with God. He's coming with vengeance to judge uh, the prideful of this world. To judge the arrogant of this world. Who act as if they are God themselves. He's coming to judge those who refuse to humble themselves to the Word of God. And as Isaiah 11 showed us last week, He will judge in favor of the meek. He will judge in favor of of the meek, those who humble themselves. This is so important in the message of the whole Bible, in the message of Scripture. This is so vitally important. Revelation 11.8 puts it this way, God will come with vengeance to destroy the wicked who destroy the earth. Think about that. He will come with vengeance to destroy those who destroy the earth. But He comes to deliver he comes to deliver the meek. Listen to this from uh, Luke chapter 1, from the lips of the mother of our Lord, Mary herself. She went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was already at this time pregnant with John the Baptist, and Mary is now also pregnant with Jesus. She goes to visit Elizabeth, and as soon as she comes into the house, Elizabeth. Uh, the baby, John the Baptist, in Elizabeth's womb, he leaps for joy. He is leaping for joy, and Elizabeth begins to prophesy and to praise God and praise God for Mary, the mother of her Lord, he, she says. And then listen to what Mary says. And Mary said, and it's so awesome how she puts this. This is put in the uh, past tense, okay? This is something, she, Jesus has just been conceived in her womb. Yet she is prophetically speaking of things that shall come to pass long into the future. And she is speaking of those things as if they have already happened. And Jesus has just been conceived in the womb. He came, even then, with healing in His wings. As Harper the Herald Angel sings, the song says, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked on the humble estate of His servants. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is His name, and His mercy is for those who fear Him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Wow. Wow. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy. And uh, this ought to be familiar by now. 
as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. Christ, the humble one, the lowly one, the ultimate meek one who was born in a manger, born in a stable, to peasant parents who was crucified like a common criminal on a Roman cross. He is the one that God raised from the dead. And He is the one who says, take upon Him His yoke, for He is meek and He is lowly of heart. The good news is for the humble today, the good news is for the meek today, listen to me now, is that Christ past is our future. And Christ's past is the future of all the earth. Listen to me now. Because Christ said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. It chills. Just think about it. Glory to God. Glory to God. The meek shall inherit the earth. Jesus said that we should lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. It's an inheritance, the Bible says of Peter, that's being kept for us, reserved, undefiled, uncorrupted, where the thief cannot break through and steal, where the rust cannot deteriorate away. It's an inheritance that is eternal in the heavens. But make no mistake about it. It's an inheritance that the meek, the meek, the humble, those who will trust in God, will enjoy on the earth forever. We need a louder amen there, brother. All of God's people said amen. 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 Thanks be to God. You may uh, stand as you're able. Close out today.